called Scottsboro Work Session Monday, 25th order, the invocation given by Mayor Shelton, and the Pledge of Allegiance given by Mike Ashburn. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us and the blessings that come with it. We just ask that you watch over these proceedings of the council and may they turn to you for the wisdom they need in difficult times. We ask that you to continue to keep your loving arms around our city and the citizens and our employees. Continue to keep us all safe. Go with us through these proceedings. It's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the work session is Calvin Cornett and LeVon Wolf. I'll come up and talk about this call. <coughs> I'm actually uh, from Huntsville, but Calvin asked me if I would come over and help him with this uh, presentation. And Calvin's a relatively new player, but he is pretty typical of what we're seeing nowadays. Those of you who are not familiar with disc golf, <coughs> disc golf is actually, by a lot of the studies that we've had done on the state, we, the Professional Disc Golf Association, yes, there is such a thing, um, it's the fastest growing sport in America. I was one of two guys that brought disc sports to the southeast back in the early 70s. Can kind I of tell you how old I am? I was a student over at UNA at that time at Sparks State. And we put the first course on campus there. It was the first, first course actually in Alabama. But in those days, we were throwing at signs and trash cans and light poles. And uh, just by coincidence, we held a large Frisbee tournament. And that day, we just called it Frisbee on campus and the executive vice president of Quamho came to Florence, Alabama for that tournament. We had people from all over the U.S., Canada, Japan, and his name is Ed Hedrick. Ed Hedrick is actually the father of the modern Frisbee, and he invented the device that we now throw our, our Frisbees into. We just call it a, a target basket, pole hole, whatever you want to call it. It catches our disc, and we have a, a game of golf, and it's played very similar to, to ball golf. But it's a lot of fun. Two years ago, for the first time in history, ball golf had fewer courses in the ground at the end of the year than what they had at the first of the year. And there's a lot of reasons for that, most of them the economics of maintaining the course. And I know the last time I was over here in Scottsboro, I did make a presentation to the Parks Department uh, with Rick Roden. And we looked at Goose Pond Colony <coughs> and the plantation. I actually have tentative to courses designed for, for those properties. But it never came through. Rick was trying to work with some grants, and it never came through. But since those early days, I moved back up from Huntsville, I moved back to Huntsville, and we started growing the sport there. Huntsville now has eight courses in town. <clears throat> and actually, within an hour's drive of Huntsville, you can now play 35 courses. In the early days, I'd go and beg people to please let us put a course in. And We'd try to raise the money, and I would actually, I still occasionally, I'd put a lot of money out of my own pocket just so we'd have another course. But the word is spread, especially to municipalities and smaller towns, to find out just how much recreation it can provide at a very low cost on a year-round basis for people of all ages. And it also can become a pretty significant source of revenue for towns that do you know, bring disc golf in. Um, I was telling Rick a moment ago that the state of Mississippi, I think they have a disc golf course in every state park that they have, and they tell us that within a year or two years when they put that course in, that it actually pays for itself from revenue from, sometimes they do charge fees to get into the parks, and all the little stores there, they will sell discs, and the disc sales alone will pay for it. But it also can be much more than that. I ran two world championships in Huntsville, and the last world championship that I ran in Huntsville <coughs> that year, I was recognized for being Huntsville's fifth largest convention. I booked 5,000 hotel, over oh, 5,000 hotel nights alone at the Hilton at that time when it was downtown. So that that actually is significant. 
We're holding, constantly holding sanction tournaments as well as just regular local events. But Huntsville has become a destination across the, actually this side of the United States because of the courses that we have there. And people actually travel to Huntsville when they're out on vacation to come into town just to play our courses. You've got a lot of people here in, in the Scottsboro area, Grant and all over from Gunnersville. Uh, that, that all these towns are looking at putting a course in, but they come to Huntsville now to play. I think there's one course over here. Uh, one of the churches here has a, a, a nine-hole course, and um, it's becoming very popular. I constantly have players asking me, Lon, what can we do to get a course in, in Scottsboro? And because he called me, I'm here to help answer any questions that you may have. Um, I've got 60, I'm right now working on my 64th disc golf project. I'm licensed and insured. I'm a certified master disc golf course designer. And not to blow my horn, I've got a little bit of success through the years. I've traveled the world playing disc golf professionally when I'm not doing my normal business. My normal business, I'm a fedora because I make prescription foot orthotics, which kind of grew hand in hand because of the biomechanics of it. Any questions? You were a world champion. Yes, sir. I've won a few. <laughs> what, um, I guess, what, what's the average cost of the The average cost is it's under $20,000. You know, there have been some cities, I think Houston, Texas put a course in, and they spent about one and a half million putting it in because <clears> the landscape <throat> was just tremendous. But um, on average, Nowadays, about the least expensive, if you put a nice course in, it's going to be about 12000 And it depends on the terrain. If you have to do a lot of excavation, bring in any, any type of heavy equipment, or you're cutting out trees down through the woods. And we do try to minimize, minimize that and, and use uh, the terrain that's there. And, and also, a lot of times, like over in Huntsville, in our Indian Creek Greenway, that's a floodplain. And they can't use that, that land for anything else on a hillside in floodplain. But for us, to put a course in is absolutely perfect. But um, we're working on a new course. Huntsville actually also closed their ball golf course two years ago. And we're going to have a world-class course on that facility along with some other things they're doing with walking, trails, um, cross-country trails, that type of thing. But if you've got a person who knows how to design it, you can design it hand-in-hand -hand and keep it safe and provide recreation for not only the beginner and newer player, but also the, have the capability of setting that course up so that you can bring, you know, top tier level players to come in and, and play it. And so you can draw people, if you do that, you can draw people when you have those tournaments. But generally, I would say it's about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars for design, purchase equipment, and complete installation. In your um, efforts, you know, looking at Scottsboro in the past, have you identified any particular areas? Yes, sir. The, uh, <clears throat> I don't, I can't tell you what duration it is, but it's at the uh, Goose Pond Colony, past where the amphitheater is. Yes. At the end of that road, we're using some of that space right past the amphitheater. At the end of that road, there's a, a low area. I could get a course in there, but honestly, it's pretty swampy, and you probably, I'd say probably four, five, six months out of a year, you may not be able to play it. Right. At that time, though, there was a, I guess you call it a retention pond when they were put in the the new dock facility there. Silver so, Pond. Yeah, they were putting, pumping that muddy water in there, and I understand that was going to be gone. I have not been back there since. If it's gone, it's still, it's still there. Well, I don't think they want to give it up just yet. <laughs> okay. Well, but that had fun. potential to do a small course, um, but it wouldn't be playable that often. <clears throat> At the same time, or shortly thereafter, within a few weeks or a month, I don't remember exactly, at the plantation course between the north, the front nine and the back nine, there's this hill, I think we call it gravel snake hill or whatever. And for I never really got off the ground. <laughs> well, it's not a gravel snake hill for a good reason to do it. It's, it's pretty rocky. Yeah. But I spent, I spent probably four or five days out there tentatively mapping out a course, and it, it's doable. And actually, during that time, they had bulldozers out there doing a lot of clearing and cutting, and it was looking pretty good. Um, and I, I had designed I could work it in so it wouldn't be any hindrance to anybody that's playing ball golf out there. Um, that's the best site that I have seen here in the Scottsboro area. If you have any other parkland, I'm not aware of anything specifically. I'm always more than happy to go out and, and take a look. 
Sure. And as I mentioned a moment ago, first and foremost, before I actually nowadays I've turned down more courses than I accept. Number one reason is people try to put it where it's not conducive and it's not safe. If you look at these discs, the top tier player nowadays, the average professional level disc golfer, can throw one of these things about 500 to 600 feet, and the world record is over 1,100 feet. And so it flies very fast. It's not something you play catch with, just like you would try to catch a golf ball. A golf ball. You don't want to catch one of these. But uh, but I can put one in safe. And uh, a person that doesn't have experience doing that, you don't want to do it. How much acreage are you talking about? Look at this island facility. The smaller, earlier courses that we put in, Bronx Spring Park in Huntsville was the seventh course installed in the world. We got two of the first ten. Redstone Arsenal was the, the ninth. Bronx Springs is on nine acres. But that was designed when we were literally throwing frisbees and not something that flies like this. I mean, that was when we were throwing them 250 to 300 feet. We still play Bronx Springs. It's still somewhat relevant as far as being a, a tight accuracy course. But 10 to 12 acres is an absolute minimum, but that would be pretty much considered to be a recreational course. Generally, generally for a really nice course, you need about 30 to 50, 60 acres. We're actually sitting the Indian Creek course I mentioned a moment ago. The, act, the actual length of Indian Creek is just over 10,000 feet. We measure disc off in feet, not yards. But um, the new course at John Hunt Park Huntsville there would be 11,400 feet and it covers probably about eight or nine holes previously that was the, the ball golf course but you can mix it you can have even tight close to walking paths I've got a number of holes in the Indian Creek Greenway it's right there adjacent to the walking path but you have to know how this flies and how the average person is going to throw it and how the average recreational person is going to throw when they screw it up because they're going to. So if you know that ahead of time, um, the terrain, the trees, the direction of the, of the hole, the, um, the prevailing winds, there's a lot of factors that come into play that, that have you design it properly. And you know, we've, we've had disc golf courses in Huntsville now since 1976. And yeah, we probably, I won't say we probably hadn't had some people that's gotten hit occasionally. But I've never known any injuries in Huntsville at all, and we've got a lot of courses and parks in, in multi-use facilities. On average, if, if a guy comes in to play, what does it cost? Not a dime. Nothing other than the cost of your disc. This disc costs $18, and so that's pretty inexpensive. Um, the, the, the normal disc is going to cost anywhere from $15 to $20. I guess like ball golfers or stick golfers as we call them, um, they may chase some clubs that's no longer made and pay ridiculous amounts. And believe it or not, we do the same thing. I've got a disc in my bag that's like $200, $250 because I can't find them anymore. And crazy, I, but I, was, I, I paid it for it because nothing else flies like it. Also, another benefit along with the the average price for this because it's a very like age doesn't have much of a uh, like it doesn't really matter how old you are you see like you actually see a lot of kids I, I saw 12 year olds who were stone 460 feet the other day but then you see people in the fence that look like Lalonde's age who are still going out there and throwing and having a good time there's not a age there's no real limit to age it's a good family recreational sport it's a good way to encourage people to get outside and just really enjoy Area. Yeah. Whenever you have those tournaments, is there an entry fee? Or? Yes, sir. And so that's how you got the, uh, I guess the hotel rooms booked and all that? Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> the Huntsville, we, we work with two different groups in Huntsville, the Tourism Bureau, <coughs> and also the Sports Commission. And then, the Sports Commission sometimes, sometimes competes with the Parks Department in how we do things and bring people in, so I don't say it's a, a political thing that we have to walk, but we do you know, whatever we feel like is best for the community. But there are fees, average, uh, it depends on what level of tournament. The PDGA, Professional Disc Golf Association, they sanction our, our events, and we have C tier all the way up to A tier, the A tier being the highest event. 
to a national tour and a pro tour. We're not on television, but every weekend, just about every weekend, you can see live on the internet. Our, most of our larger events are now live on the internet. Actually, CBS approached us a couple of years ago wanting to put our four majors on, on regular television. We told them, actually told them, not yet. We're not quite ready. We're getting there. Our dollars are not where ball golf is, but this is the first year, actually, there's a fellow named Paul Macbeth. I've known him since he's about 10 years old. Paul Macbeth will make over well over a million dollars this year playing disc golf. <clears throat> On that note, I go to church where that one disc uh, golf course is down there. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> not everybody's professional. I saw one guy throw one, and when I look back up, he's in the bean field across the street. <laughs> <laughs> you watch me? <laughs> yes, sir. Only good in the microphone for fun. What about it? Uh, Grand Couldn't get it. I tried to get uh, my key foods. Little Debbie was trying to uh, to put a physical activity in every state of the nation. <coughs> applied and at that time. They said that disc golf was not. They didn't look at it as a large would, would attract a large enough group of people. They wanted to go on something that would attract hordes of people. So I was not able to get that, get that grant. And it was twenty thousand dollars grant. Everywhere. We put a course in, even now in small communities, anybody know, familiar with Fairview, Alabama? About 13 miles outside of Coleman. Fairview called us down there and we put a, a course in their park. And what was exciting to me was to see the parks department get excited about it. And they maintain that course along with the, the, if you put a course in, the kids will find it and they will form a club and they take great pride in it. We put courses in parks that have drug issues, all type of things that were legal issues, and usually that disappears because the people, now you've got traffic in that course, in, on that, in that park, that take care of it, maintain it, and they'll actually run the riffraff off. But the community in Fairview, Alabama, I mean, it just exploded, and the kids were out there every day, they got something to do, and it's amazing to see what has happened, and now it's been in there it's about five years. And those kids are, there's a lot of really good level players coming out of Fairview, Alabama. But Coleman did the same thing. They got a course. Parcel now, now has two courses. Decatur has two courses. Actually, Calhoun over in um, Calhoun Decatur campus. I put a course on, on that campus last fall, and now I'm putting six holes in the, in the Huntsville campus, but it's just a small prototype course. But everywhere we put a course, you know, people come and they play. And they'll start hosting events. But the main, main number one thing, as he mentioned a moment ago, is it does provide recreation for all ages. I can't tell you how many people I have, but in, in the back of my regular business, I've got a little disc golf shop. And I do it for two reasons. One, because of the revenue that I raise there, I get to put back to the course and I get to see my friends. I can't tell you how many people I have coming in the, during the day that they're retired. They're my age and older coming in to buy this so they can get out because it beats what they say just a regular going out for a walk. Now they got a little bit more exercise when they're playing disc golf. And if you've never seen anybody actually throw a, a golf disc, um, it's way more physical, it can be way more physical than ball golf. Anyone have any, any questions? Uh, also, just kind of a point. Another focus about this is he's taking a lot. There's several courses within an hour out of Huntsville. Well, between other than the one that's at uh, Agape, there's nothing between here and Huntsville, at least that I'm aware of, nor here in Chattanooga. Scottsboro is kind of a geologically is in a pretty good central spot to kind of try to, you know, Sand Mountain and your local areas around Bridgeport and then you be bringing turns and stuff. You kind of had a good note of, you know, I'm sure, you know, the Huntsville's group would come, then Chattanooga's big club would come, and so you kind of have that good middle ground to draw in more people in areas that have a longer drive. There's nothing in Northeast Alabama. I think the closest course here may be Cloudland Canyon. There's a course at Cloudland.
I mean, I mean, this is something y'all just want to look at. Just need three packets. There's uh, three different, or four different things. Uh, one is just an introduction to disc golf. Just kind of one of these used. And then it's the next part is just kind of some points that I was going through and getting this presentation prepared. Some information on LeVon of how he's insured and just all the wisdom that he has on the course. And then lastly, there's a little article that's, uh, is it the Evans State Park, in Mississippi? Um, yes, well, he was one of the parks in um, Mississippi. He wrote about the impact that putting disc golf courses into Mississippi State Parks impacted their income and just the, you know, just the population that the parks includes. Just to kind of give an idea of what it might look like in Scottsburg if you had a course installed. I'd like to thank uh, the council money each of you and Mayor Shelton for allowing me to come and speak to you uh, tonight regarding a proposed bond issue uh, for an addition to the Scottsboro Jackson Heritage Center. Uh, I'm serving as spokesperson for our museum commission and I am proud to say that we have a majority of our board members here in attendance tonight along with our director and her assistant Jared Holcomb and I would like you all to stand real quickly and let the council see you all that's here. We have 18 members of our board and it's very reassuring to see that many of our members here tonight. The Scottsboro Museum Commission was established by Mayor Roy Owens and the Council in September of 1980 when they purchased the Brown Proctor House for use as a local history museum and cultural center to help serve the cultural needs of the people of Scottsboro and Jackson County. The leadership, the dedication of volunteers, the hard work, and the financial support of a lot of good Jackson County people led to the development of the Heritage Center as you know it today. Our purpose is to maintain a nonprofit museum that's dedicated to the preservation and interpretation of cultural and social history in Jackson County and the Northeast region of the, of the state. Its inception, at its inception, the vision of the museum was that it be used by the citizens of Jackson County and that it accommodate the visual and the performing arts and support a wide variety of community activities, including civic and community <coughs> meetings, receptions, social functions, and lectures. Directors and members of the Museum Commission have always strived diligently over the years to carry out the mission of the museum. But it's hard to do that when we lack the space uh, to move, where entertainment is regulated to the front porch during cold, wet weather when we don't have anywhere to put them inside because of the attendance uh, at the function. Uh, where standing in the stairwell is necessary sometimes for some of our choirs to perform in functions. While parents are in, uh, attending art exhibits that we sponsor, uh, we have art that is displayed in the entire downstairs and then some, most of our elementary art that's hung upstairs and in the stairwells. And we have 350 to 400 people coming through to see that art on Mother's Day and people can't get up the stairwells to look and do. And when you have stairs that are very narrow and steep and turn, it's very hard for people to get up and down without an accident waiting to happen. Handicapped accessible is not a term that we use for the Heritage Center. It's very difficult for people who have uh, motor skill problems who are in wheelchairs or walkers to get into our building and to get to places where we have exhibits. Uh, we have to turn down exhibits because we don't have the space to hold uh, the square footage that those exhibits require. 
we can't host state association meetings for different ones because we don't have a place to hold 150 to 200 uh, attendees for that. <coughs> we have parents who stand outside at Christmas time when we have functions because we can't get them all in for them to have their children have a visit with Santa. They'll stand in the rain, they'll stand in the cold, but they will stand there for an hour or two hours to get those children in uh, for our functions. We need a place that we can hold receptions where people in the community can come and have uh, birthday parties, family reunions, wedding, baby showers, uh, those types of things. Uh, the city does not have a place that will accommodate a small group of people, and by small I'm saying anywhere from 25 to 200 people. This Pond Colony is too large. It's out of the way. Our place won't hold much more than our board members sometimes when we get in uh, to have our monthly board meetings. So we need additional space, not only for exhibits, but for those civic and uh, community activities that we have. We have a beautiful facility, but we just need more space. We first began working toward the 3,000 square foot addition that we're talking about in February of 2013. So we've been at this process for a while. We first approached Mayor uh, Potter with the idea of the addition, and he, with his help and vision, he worked with the current city council uh, over the next two years to try to make our dream become a reality. In December of 2015, and that seems like a long time ago, but it was not that far back, I spoke to the members of the council in a work session, just as I'm doing tonight, about including the Heritage Center in the bond issue that was proposed then. In early 2016, there was, were committees formed with the four projects that were underway, and a council person was put in each of those committees. We worked very diligently with our council member that was assigned with us in finalizing our plans and always working within the budget that would have been set with that proposed bond issue. In, on February the 22nd, the council voted to include us in that bond issue along with three other projects. Shortly thereafter, we were very disappointed that not only our project but some others were not done because of the first project that was started having cost projections that were more than or what first projected. Anyway, we were disappointed but we never gave up hope that this uh, our building project would come to the forefront again. We feel that this addition will allow us to grow as a museum and expand programs and exhibits for the community. The 3,000 square foot addition will include two exhibit meeting rooms as well as accommodate 175 to 200 people. It will include much needed storage space. It will be a handicap accessible one story addition so that it will be easy entrance into the new addition and transition into the current museum. It will also have handicapped restrooms, which we don't have, and it will also include a larger kitchen that will be able to be used for these other functions. We're not asking for a Taj Mahal. We are trying to be very realistic with what we want. We want something that is in keeping with the current museum that will be something that the community and the museum board will be very proud, that everyone will be proud to have as a part of that museum. We don't intend to do any renovation with the current Brown Proctor House. The only place that would be impacted would be a double window in the dining room that would serve as a connector into the new addition and even the window will be used in another portion of that building. Members of the executive committee have met with each one of you and you have 
very generously giving your time to look at the plans that we had developed, to look at the cost projection that we had, to ask us any question uh, that you have about what we are proposing. And we appreciate your time and your interest in doing that. We have told you when we have talked with you that if you give us or commit to the sum that uh, was in that first bond proposal, any overrun, we will work very hard to raise the money to cover any additional cost. We will not come back and ask the city for any additional money because of increased construction cost or that. We are willing to do what we need to do to help get the addition. I visited with Sheila Shepard with EDA and I've also visited with uh, Rick Rowan with the Chamber. They looked at the plans and I asked their input of how they felt that those plans and the addition would contribute to them doing their jobs in selling Scottsboro and what impact it would have. Uh, Ms. Shepard was very uh, enthusiastic and could see how that would help them uh, when they bring businesses in that are looking to relocate or industry looking to locate here. Uh, I gave you a copy of the letter from the Chamber of Commerce that uh, I received with their input and their thoughts on um, what the addition would mean to the community. Your yes vote on the proposed bond issue that would include the addition for the Heritage Center will show the citizens of Scottsboro and newcomers that we are a progressive citizen, a, excuse me, a progressive city who holds our past in esteem and reverence and that we look forward uh, to the future of our city with pride and progressive growth opportunities. The projects that have been done in the past, whether it's ball fields, dog parks, retcon, any of those have all been of value to uh, the city. And they're mainly geared toward young families. But they help attract industry and, they, uh, and their employees to Scottsboro. And this is important when we're talking about bringing folks here. And we feel that the museum and the service that we do, the work that our staff does with genealogy and the outreach they have with that, all of that is important to and will be an asset uh, to the young folks and the older ones in our community and will also show that we are interested in the preservation of the area's history and its historical uh, resources. That museum property and building is a city-owned property. And we're very pleased that we have the opportunity to reside in that as a museum and have those grounds and facilities and the buildings that we have there. It's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place to hold functions uh, and to share with the community. And we think that the addition will make it an even greater investment with the community and that it will continue to make Scottsboro a great place and a beautiful place to be. Uh, I thank you for your time and for your consideration and hope that you will vote yes uh, on this uh, bond issue and the possibility of including our addition with that. And if you have any questions that we've not answered, if we can answer those in any way, I'd be glad to try. And if I can't, maybe some of our other board members, Ms. Kilmer has been here a lot longer than I have, and if I can't answer it, she might can. Thank you. Ms. Ivy. Ms. I just want to confirm that y'all are just asking for what you were approved by the previous council. Yes. And anything else is going to be raised. If, if you give us uh, the amount that was there and the additional is a hundred or hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, I'm not going to come back and stand here and ask you for any more than what you have approved. We know that building costs have probably increased ten to fifteen percent. We're willing to do what we can to negotiate and see if we can make any changes without losing our square footage or the integrity of what we're proposing to do. 
And if it means that we have to raise the additional monies, we will do everything in our power to raise the additional to fund it and not ask you to do it. Have y'all had a contractor at all give you a price? We had gotten so far with the plans <coughs> that we had uh, back in January of 16. Mm -hmm. We had made all of our decisions. <coughs> Everything was ready to go. We had been given a breakdown uh, that gave us the projected cost, uh, which was when you look at only those projected costs, was a little bit less than the amount that was given the last time. But when you look at contingency fees, uh, you look at uh, architects, oversight fees, and that, it raised it by about $100,000. So we anticipate um, something in that neighborhood and know that we'll have our work to do too. I've got a question on this Yes. What was that dollar amount? What the dollar it? amount that we, that the council agreed to give you? Five hundred thousand. And those plans, you know, I know we got we talked about projected costs. Is that ready to be bid out? No. I mean, I'm sorry, but because I was involved in. in he yeah, lost. Yeah, yes. they, we 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 had to put a stop to the architect because the fees were going up and we didn't couldn't forecast sure. the money being there and we had to stop those architectural fees because they were they were going up. Uh, when they saw how the first project was going, that was when we the decision was made like to stop all work correct. at that time. But I've got a phone call on that. Yeah, they had done a tremendous amount of work. So do we know how far along, I mean how much more work we would have to do? I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm assuming that uh, the we same... Did, we got... They never did get to the detailed plans to put it out to be it. We, we stopped it. We were right at yeah. getting them ready yes, to go. That's correct. Yes. Well, the engineering firm does this in percentage. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, they were. We'd, we'd need to renegotiate that for sure. <laughs> the city did pick up those architectural fees to that point. Yes, ma'am. But we have um, the last set of plans, the ones that y'all looked at. Uh, we have those. We see no reason to make any changes with that. Uh, I think there was there were two options uh, given to us. Um, one was on flooring. Uh, carpet was included in the price uh, projection. Um, we don't need carpet in meeting rooms. Uh, we would look at um, what would be a luxury vinyl plank floor uh, now, something that would hold up to wear in uh, the <coughs> And the other thing was that we would have loved to have had a standing metal seam roof that would match what is currently on the Brown Proctor house. But for the difference in cost, we'll have to live with a 25 or 30 year shingle roof until such time as it would have to be replaced and then revisit that. How much money do we have to consider? Each year? Yeah. Uh, Does the county, do they have what I told you? We get no funding from the county and we get 33000 from the council. They've got a lodging tax. And we get a quarter of 1% of the lodging tax. Yeah, it's about 37000 last year. Yeah. So we we operate on about a sixty-seven, sixty-nine thousand dollar budget a year. That pays salaries and operating expenses. And of course, we do get have gotten assistance with the Bowman Foundation grant for years for some maintenance issues that we've had, painting, um, some roof repair, and those types of things that we're very grateful for. Any other questions? If you have any, think of anything, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.